Good morning, everybody. My name is Dietmar Schweizgut. I am the Secretary General of the Austrian French Center for Rapprochement in Europe. And it's a particular pleasure for me to welcome all of you to a discussion which I think nobody would have thought would uh, acquire a lot of interest uh, only a couple of weeks ago. But after the invasion of Russia into Ukraine, uh, European security, of course, is discussed in a completely different perspective. And this raises also the question, to what extent uh, security policy, the concepts of uh, neutrality and non-alignment need to be discussed <clears throat> in a completely new context. And not only uh, because in the case of Ukraine, of course, uh, the future status once hostilities have ended and uh, we come to a settlement uh, will be discussed under different perspectives, including uh, the issue of security guarantees, but also because the concept of neutrality and non-alignment in Europe itself, in the framework of the European Union, but beyond, uh, have also acquired a new dimension, uh, especially, of course, with uh, the uh, decision in Finland and Sweden uh, to uh, join NATO in the in the near future, but also because we have a discussion even in those countries which traditionally uh, are seen almost as the role model of neutrality, like uh, Switzerland with its long tradition, but also in the case of Austria, where the neutrality uh, has become part of the national identity. And in this respect, I think it will be very useful to discuss to what extent uh, we really need to look uh, in a new way at those issues. And I was actually quite struck also when I saw the address by the Swiss federal president to the Davos Forum uh, opened uh, earlier this week uh, when he addressed the issue of neutrality and specifically said, neutrality of course does not mean standing aside. Neutrality is in fact the sister of solidarity. Uh, and I find this actually uh, sort of a nice phrasing uh, because we all need to look not only at solidarity, but also to the extent in within the European Union, to what extent this also has an impact on the future architecture of uh, Europe's security uh, post Ukraine. But I, I leave it with that. We have uh, not only a fascinating panel, but I'm also very grateful that we have uh, uh, again uh, Dominique uh, David, who is not only the executive chairman of IFRI, the Institut Francais de Relations Internationales, but who happens also to be double-headed and be the president of the Austrian French Center. So I'm very grateful to you, Dominique, for having accepted to chair this meeting. And uh, I leave it to you to introduce the panel and steer the discussion. Once again, thank you very much and a warm welcome to everybody. Merci, Dietmar. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Um, uh, thank you for participating to, to our debate on those two notions. Uh, uh, our objective this morning is, is twofold. The first is uh, an, uh, a problem of definition. What are those notions? It seems that they have uh, uh, as many definitions as uh, countries. Uh, uh, who uh, uh, feel they are neutral or non-aligned. Uh, and uh, uh, may I say that for French specifically, those, notion, those two notions are particularly mysterious. <laughs> so, uh, much more accustomed to think international relations in terms of a balance of power or collective security. So, so for a problem of general definition. And second, of course, Dietmar already mentioned it, a, a, a more a present problem for the uh, uh, the interpretation of those notions in terms of uh, future security for Europe. First, for the case of, of Ukraine, of course, even if we are not in charge to define the future uh, strategic status of Ukraine. And second, for some other countries, uh, you mentioned uh, uh, Dietmar, Sweden uh, and Finland. You mentioned Switzerland also. Uh, you didn't mention Austria, but uh, we know that uh, uh, in various countries, uh, the debate is uh, open or half open on, on the future of, the, of those notions. Uh, for this session, uh, we uh, we have uh, four uh, prominent personalities. 
Uh, let me introduce them briefly. They are all of them uh, specialists uh, in one way or another of, of those questions. Uh, Madame Sophie Enos Attali, first, bonjour, Madame, uh, is a professor at the Catholic Institute uh, of Paris. She has extensively published on uh, um, neutrality, European security, problems of uh, Northern uh, European countries, and she is also editor in chief of the very well known. Uh, uh, annuaire français des uh, relations internationales. Uh, Monsieur Thomas Mayharting, Monsieur l'ambassadeur, bonjour, uh, um, is a, a former Austrian uh, ambassador to the United Nations and a former EU ambassador to the same United Nations and is a former political director at the Federal Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, in Austria. Madame Hanna Oyana, bonjour madame, uh, is research director of the Faculty of Management of Business and Business of the Tampere University, and she has previously worked at the Swedish Institute for International Affairs and for the European Union Research Program of the Finnish Institute of uh, International Affairs. And last but not least, uh, Monsieur l'Ambassadeur Daniel Vocker, bonjour Monsieur l'Ambassadeur, is a former ambassador for Switzerland, and he is also the founder and was the first director of the very well-known uh, Geneva Center for Security Policy. Thank you very much for all of you, uh, to all of you for participating uh, to this debate and uh, having uh, accepted to introduce it. If you don't mind, I will give the floor in the order I mentioned uh, in your biographies. May I ask you to limit the presentation roughly to, to, to 15 minutes? And so we will have uh, some time left to, uh, for discussion and dialogue on those two very uh, important notions. Madame Sophie Enosatali, vous avez la parole, the floor is yours. Merci beaucoup, thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, thanks a lot, and thanks to the organizers for this uh, invitation. Um, so um, I be, I'm going to introduce uh, the notion of neutrality, well, what it is on a historical and legal point of view. And um, so let's begin with the word in itself. So the word neutrality comes from the Latin ne uta, uh, which means neither. And it refers uh, to the situation of a state which remains outside a conflict between several states. But uh, what is neutrality more preci precisely? Um, so I, I will begin with uh, a quotation from the Bible. Whoever is not against us is with us, uh, says this quotation. And um, this says a lot about the perception of neutrality in the past. During a long time, Neutrality was held as something inappropriate and as um, morally um, unjustified. Uh, the theory suggests a legitimate war, generally considered non participation in this, in this type of war as contrary to morality. And more generally, um, neutrality in the past was often associated with an attitude of pronunciation, of passivity. Um, even of cowardice, it was uh, qualified as immoral, as uh, hypocritical. Nevertheless, uh, as soon as in the 16th century, neutrality began to be recognized as an attitude that could be uh, valid, um, especially with uh, Hugo Grotius, the, the Dutch lawyer, uh, who said that it may be acceptable for a country to be neutral in a conflict in cases where it is difficult to make the distinction between the good cause and the bad cause. In that way, being neutral avoids uh, supporting a bad cause. But it was not only, uh, it was not until the mid 19th century that neutrality was recognized as a legal concept. Uh, the first texts uh, where uh, the word appears are the Treaty of Paris of 1856, uh, that ended the war in Crimea, and uh, the arbitration compromise between uh, the United States and Great Britain in uh, 1871. And then 
at the very end of the 19th century uh, at the Hague Peace, the first Hague Peace Conference, uh, the participants to the conference recommended that neutral powers um, offer their good offices or mediation to contribute to the settlement, to the peaceful settlement of, uh, of a conflict. Finally, um, with the convention number five and number 13 uh, that were adopted in 1907 uh, at, the, at, the, at the Second Hague Conference, neutrality was institutionalized in international law. So as we can see, uh, the perception of neutrality has uh, evolved through history until it was uh, legally institutionalized uh, at the very uh, beginning of the 20th century. Um, nevertheless, um, the, 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 the concept of neutrality uh, gave rise to uh, criticism after the, during and after uh, the, the world wars. Um, with the emergence of total war um, during World War I, the idea spread that peace could only be assured if all states undertook uh, to assist the attack states. And um, in 1917, uh, in a speech to the Congress, the American President Woodrow Wilson said um, uh, that uh, neutrality is no longer feasible or desirable where the peace of the world and the freedom of its people are concerned. So uh, neutrality uh, during the First World War or just afterwards appeared to many as a betrayal of the common interests. And um, during the Second World War, most of the European neutral states found themselves annexed or had to make um, economic and even military concessions to the stronger belligerents. And after the conflict, neutrality was hence again the subject of uh, criticism. And um, the creation of the United Nations raised once more the question of the relevance of neutrality. And the international lawyer, uh, Hersch Lauterfeld, pointed out that neutrality and collective security are, uh, this is a quotation, mutually exclusive. The more there is of one, the less there is of the other. Um, however, um, even if the UN Charter requires UN members to provide assistance to the Security Council, uh, several countries claiming to be neutral, uh, except Switzerland until 2002, became members of the Collective Security Organization. And um, during the Cold War, um, the, the question of neutrality was uh, interpreted. Neutrality was interpreted quite differently uh, depending on the countries. But I will uh, say uh, a few words uh, later about that. So, um, as uh, I mentioned, it neutrality was institutionalized only a century ago, uh, really before, and uh, its perception evolved quite a lot. But um, what does neutrality refer to on a legal point of view and even uh, uh, on a practical point of view? First of all, it is important uh, to underline there, that there exist different forms of neutrality that can be distinguished from each other according to their duration or their anchorage. Um, first, there is uh, occasional neutrality, also known as temporary neutrality or ne ad hoc neutrality, that refers to a state that claims to be neutral in a particular war. Um, neutrality originally appeared as an ad hoc neutrality. The choice of a country to be neutral in a given conflict has no impact on its behavior in peacetime or on its relationship to another conflict. Um, permanent neutrality uh, on the other side, is also, uh, which is also known as perpetual or eternal neutrality, took shape in the 19th century, um, especially with Switzerland, whose neutrality was declared perpetual by the Congress of Vienna in 1815. And perpetual, permanent neutrality refers to the intention of the state to remain neutral, uh, to remain outside any conflict 
whether it is ongoing or a future conflict. And uh, of course, to be able to claim such a position, a state must not only fulfill the duties of occasional neutrals in times of war, but it, it must also comply with certain obligations in times in time of peace. And uh, I will discuss that a little bit later. The other difference uh, between uh, there, there is another distinction to make between uh, two uh, forms of neutrality. Uh, between the de facto neutrality and the de jure neutrality. De facto neutrality emerged from repeated occasional neutrality and is in general a result of a tradition, of a habit of abstaining from any participation in a conflict. It has no legal basis and, um, and the, state, the state which claims to be de facto neutral is free at any time to modify its policy by notifying it. The de jure neutrality is enshrined in a national or international text. Uh, it is legally binding um, and um, it often implies a commitment on the part of third countries to respect the sovereignty and uh, the territorial integrity of the neutral states uh, in, uh, during conflicts. And of course, um, a de jure neutral country that wishes to uh, give up uh, this position uh, has to resort to a legal procedure uh, to make uh, to achieve this, uh, this goal. So now uh, that we have that we've just made this distinction, what are the rights and the duties uh, attached to neutrality? Um, so the norms attached to neutrality are for some of them set out in legal texts and for the rest are the result of custom. Uh, most of these uh, rights and duties apply to neutrals, but others may be applied by belligerents. So let's speak first about the legal obligations uh, for neutral countries. So the they, they are written in the Hague Convention number five and number 13 that uh, specify the rights and duties of neutral countries in the land war and in the naval war. Uh, first of all, both texts make a clear distinction between the states, which have the rights and duties of neutrality, and the individuals and enterprises under its jurisdiction, which as private entities are not exactly banned by neutrality. Um, so uh, what are the, the, the duties uh, of um, neutral uh, country? Uh, according, uh, I, I, um, I chose to, uh, to follow uh, the, the, research, the Finnish researcher Hatton Hakobirta, who distinguishes four categories of duties. Uh, the first duty is the duty of abstention, which, pro which prohibits neutrals from giving any military support to a state at war. The second duty is a duty of prevention and defense that enjoins neutral countries to ensure that the status of neutrality is not violated. And in the event um, of a violation of this neutrality, neutral countries have to defend themselves. Um, and they can resort to all means at their disposal uh, to, uh, to reach this goal. The third duty is the duty of tolerance, which obliges the neutral to accept the intervention of belligerents on the high seas in the circumstances of economic blockade or swimming, smuggling. Sorry. And, um, and finally, there is a duty of impartiality. Neutrals uh, are supposed to treat belligerents in the same way. And, uh, but at the same time, um, they are not obliged to trade on the same qualitative and quantitative terms with all parties to a conflict. Regarding the duties of belligerent countries towards neutrals, they are quite limited. The belligerent countries are obliged to respect neutral countries, in particular their territorial integrity. So they, they may not use the territory of neutral countries for military purposes. These uh, are the legal um, provisions regarding neutrality. But beyond this, uh, besides these provisions, there exist uh, customary practices, also referred as 
uh, referred to as secondary duties. And um, be behind the secondary duties lies uh, the following idea. Uh, permanent neutrality is only viable if it is internationally accepted. And uh, for this to happen, it must generate a sufficient degree of confidence on the international arena. There was, um, therefore, the secondary duties consist in a specific behavior, not only in times of war, but uh, also in times of peace. The first duty of a country that wants to be credible as a neutral uh, country is to pursue a policy of persuasion. This consists in providing proof that it will be able to be impartial in time of war. So concretely, this involves adopting an, an aggressive, uh, a respectful and predictable attitude. But uh, of, of course, it also involves uh, not to enter any alliance that could eventually lead to a participation in a war. Um, the policy of persuasion also consists in offering actual and potential belligerents a positive image of neutrality. Neutrals uh, ha have to convince the other countries of the, of the usefulness of neutrality. That's why most of neutral countries usually work to promote universal ideas um, and uh, most of the time want to offer themselves as mediators and uh, host international organization on their territory. All these duties are meant to make neutrals appear as a factor of stability on the international area, arena and um, to give a positive image of neutrality. Besides this policy of persuasion, countries, uh, neutral countries have to pursue a policy of deterrence, which aims to make neutrality respectable. It is meant to ensure the non-violation of neutrality by dissuading uh, actual and potential belligerents from attacking a neutral country. That's why uh, most neutral countries um, usually um, uh, have a, a, strong, uh, a strong army. Uh, they, they, they must demonstrate internal stability and have a powerful, well-trained and highly equipped army. So persuasion and dissuasion go hand in hand and even tend to compensate each other. Consequently, we can say that there are many combinations of persuasion and dissuasion, which vary from one country to another, depending on geopolitical criteria. And okay, so I, I will have, yeah, I have much more to say, but maybe uh, uh, I keep that for the discussion. Oh, I'm sorry to interrupt you no, very no, violently, fine. apparently. I'm sorry. You will add a, a lot of remarks during the discussion. Thank you very much for this introduction. Uh, I, I'm sorry to... Uh, your presentation suggested me just one, one uh, rude question. We, in all those definitions, do you think that one remains uh, pertinent in, 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 in the Europe, uh, uh, in the future Europe, will be characterized uh, uh, evidently by, by uh, uh, more division and more opposition between, uh, between the, the coming blocks, I should say. But don't, don't answer uh, to my question uh, just now. Uh, but as you are a professor of, of political science, I think you will have uh, at least uh, half of a, an answer to, to, to my question. Uh, thank you very much. Monsieur Ambassador Beiharting, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you very much. I will try to summarize as rapidly as possible uh, a brief survey on the history of Austrian neutrality and what this means today uh, that we are faced with the war of aggression uh, by Russia against Ukraine. I mean, first of all, I think the historical circumstances of Austrian neutrality are relatively well known, but not in all its details. Uh, obviously, uh, the decision of Austria to become a neutral country was linked with its negotiations with the then Soviet Union in 1955. And in the so-called Moscow Memorandum of April 55, Austria promised to practice a neutrality following the Swiss model. 
I think it's important to understand that this was a political commitment, but that the decision to become neutral was based on Austrian constitutional law. And the Austrian constitutional uh, law was voted only after the Soviet Union and the other occupying powers had left Austria in October 1955. Um, therefore, uh, contrary to general belief uh, or a broad belief, Austrian neutrality is not based on the state treaty, it is based on Austrian constitutional legislation. And on that basis, it is also the belief of Austrian lawyers that Austria would have the possibility to abrogate its neutrality nationally again on the basis of a constitutional decision, obviously needing to inform partners of this change, but it would be a unilateral decision. When we said we would follow the Swiss model, We've, uh, we did not follow uh, the Swiss model from the very outset in two, uh, in two dimensions. First of all, we never took the military dimension of neutrality as seriously as Switzerland did. The Austrian army, I think, frankly, was never in a position uh, to provide the kind of national defense that the Swiss armed forces have provided. And I think that during the Cold War, uh, we in, re in reality uh, profited uh, indirectly, although not formally, uh, from the NATO umbrella. I will then speak of the situation after the end of the Cold War in a minute. On the other hand, we accept that we followed uh, a policy which we called active neutrality policy, which led to an engagement in international relations that went beyond what Switzerland uh, considered fitting for a neutral country, at least at the beginning. We joined uh, the United Nations in 1955, uh, whereas Switzerland only joined the United Nations in 2002, and Austria became a member of the uh, United Nations uh, Security Council for the first time in 1973, which Switzerland will be doing next year, if I remember correctly, for the first time uh, in its history. So there were differences there from the very outset, and especially during the chancellorship of Chancellor uh, Kreisky, we pushed very much for this idea of providing the good offices, becoming like Switzerland, of course, did a seat of international organizations, the United Nations, and his specific engagement in the Middle East was also seen as part of our active neutrality policy. When Austria applied uh, for uh, membership in the European Union in 89, and it's worthwhile noting that we did this a little earlier than the other uh, neutral uh, uh, countries uh, at the time, at a time when the uh, Iron Curtain was still there, in fact. In our letter to Brussels, as it was called, we said that we assumed that we would get a reservation in primary law of the European Union to maintain uh, neutrality, our obligations of neutrality constitutionally, as well as being able to continue an active policy of neutrality as our specific contribution uh, to European uh, peace and security. This at the time was not understood by anyone, uh, even then in 1989, and uh, the then uh, Belgian uh, foreign minister, Mark Eiskens, at the time even suggested that if that was the Austrian position, the first step by the European Union probably ought to be, or the European communities, as they were still then called, would be to negotiate with the Soviet Union uh, to see whether Austria joining uh, the European Union was a possibility that the Soviet Union accepted. Obviously, this was not a path that was then chosen, but Austria, in the course of its negotiations, understood that it had to at least relativize the stance with which it had started out uh, in 1989. And when we finally um, joined the European Union together with uh, Sweden and Finland uh, in uh, 95, there is this famous declaration on uh, common foreign and security policy, which is attached uh, to the accession treaty, which says, amongst other things, the new member states will, from the time of their accession, be ready and able to participate fully and actively in the common foreign and security policy as defined in the Treaty on European Union, and the new member states will also uh, create the necessary legal requirements within their national legislation to make this possible. And this was obviously a demand directed more to Austria than to others because we had legal limitations that the others did not have. On the other hand, it is also true that even when we joined, there was a certain understanding that neutral countries 
are a little different from others when it comes to the common foreign and security policy of the European Union, because even at the time, the European legal uh, documents contain something that is called the Irish Clause, which basically says that whatever the European Union does in the field of defense will not prejudice the specific character of the security and defense policy of certain member states. And this applies in particular to the perspective of European defense and also to the collective uh, security guarantees that were included uh, in the European uh, Union uh, Treaty at a later stage. So there was always a certain understanding uh, within Austria and also I have to say uh, from Finland and Sweden at the time who pushed for this, uh, uh, for this clause that uh, we would not be subjected uh, to uh, obligations that would force us to completely abrogate neutrality. But we, what we did do as we had promised was adapt uh, the Austrian legislation in this uh, uh, context. And we entered the Austrian constitution is more flexible than other constitutions in the sense that you can simply add a new article to the constitution that then abrogates partially at least articles that are already in the constitution. And in addition, we have constitutional laws uh, which are outside of the overall, uh, the basic constitution like the constitutional law on neutrality. But we, amongst other things, we voted in 98, uh, and this is sort of a fascinating subject for Austrian constitutional lawyers, perhaps not necessarily to the same extent uh, to everybody else. We voted uh, uh, an article to the constitutional, which is the Article 23J, which says, amongst other things, Austria participates in the common foreign and security policy of the European Union on the basis of the relevant title of the Treaty on European Union. And it, uh, it mentions, amongst other things, the fact that we participate in European Union sanctions, that we can participate in crisis management, and it even mentions the possibility of Austrian participation in operations by combat forces uh, in crisis management. So in reality, what this uh, uh, article did, uh, 23J, was that it reduced Austrian neutrality to what we call the, call the core elements of neutrality, in particular, the fact that we will not join an alliance, but it made it possible for us to do things that are in contradiction with what Mrs. Enos Atali uh, just explained as uh, common principles of neutrality, in particular, the duty of abstention and impartiality in certain circumstances as I will then uh, um, explain on the basis of what has happened uh, since we joined, uh, uh, since the, Euro uh, the, the war against uh, Ukraine erupted. But the problem was, of course, that these changes, which are quite important, uh, whenever, I mean, they were voted in Parliament, they were voted with the necessary constitutional majorities, but there was never uh, a substantive discussion with the Austrian public on what had really happened. I mean, there's a broad belief in the Austrian public that we continue to be neutral as we were, and nobody has really fully understood the very far-reaching impact that this legislation uh, can have on, uh, on uh, the way we exercise our security policy. There was a brief discussion on whether Austria uh, should uh, join NATO uh, in uh, 90, uh, 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 798, where I was one of the uh, few uh, civil servants at the time uh, in favor of this, supporting then Austrian Foreign Minister uh, Wolfgang Schüssel, but at the end of the day also because of the war in Kosovo, which then sort of cooled down enthusiasm uh, uh, for this idea, uh, the whole discussion slowed down and we stayed where we are. Now, uh, one of the, I mean, the, the European Union enlargement in particular has fundamentally altered the geopolitical situation of Austria in two extents. The one is that on the one hand, we are now surrounded uh, with the exception of Switzerland and the Principality of Liechtenstein uh, by NATO countries on all sides. And this makes a great difference to Finland in particular uh, in the present uh, circumstances. The other change, which is sort of less obvious, is that we have at the same time less obvious to the Austrian public, albeit possibly to others, is that we've become part of a political union uh, where it is far, far more difficult to accept the idea that external partners will perceive us as something different from the other member states of the European uh, Union. And I think 
think now during the Ukrainian uh, uh, war, during the war against Ukraine, I mean, it became very obvious to Austria that Austria, like all other member states of the European Union, perhaps with the exception of Hungary, but that's another matter, is considered as an unfriendly uh, country uh, by the uh, Russian uh, Federation. And we had this experience on which there was quite a lot of discussion in Austria and elsewhere of the Austrian Chancellor uh, traveling uh, first to Ukraine and then uh, to Moscow. And the one thing that I noted was that when he traveled to Moscow, the one thing he had to do and needed to do and did in fact quite effectively was simply present the European Union position from A to Z. So even if he went there and even if he may, he may have had a better chance of being received there than some other uh, leaders of European Union, countries, the message was a 100% European Union message. So going there certainly uh, cannot be defined as an example of an active uh, policy of neutrality because the message was not different uh, from what everybody else said on the subject. Now, uh, speaking about, uh, and this will be the final part of my introductory presentation, speaking about the effect of uh, Ukraine uh, on on uh, on Austrian uh, on on the Austrian policy of neutrality, if you want to call it that, uh, the, we have, as you know, uh, participated in all decisions, one way or the other, uh, affecting Ukraine within the European Union. Regarding these uh, CFSP uh, decisions, which uh, provide um, military, uh, which foresee the provision of military material uh, to Ukraine, we have, that is true, uh, used uh, uh, a possibility that is foreseen in the Treaty on European Union of constructive abstention. But constructive abstention basically means that we made this decision possible for the rest of the European Union. Uh, we are in fact involved in the financing mechanisms. I mean, it is too complicated uh, to explain all the details, but we are. And we, are, uh, we have accepted in accordance with the Treaty of European Union that this is a decision that commits the European Union as a whole. And then when you speak about constructive abstention, it is worth noting that uh, the article in the treaty, Article 31, uh, says that in a spirit of mutual solidarity, the member states concerned shall refrain from any action likely to conflict with or impede union action based on that decision, and the other member states shall respect its position. Now, I mean, uh, uh, ref uh, refraining from any uh, decision that could uh, potentially impede that decision basically means that we have to allow the transit uh, of this military material over Austrian territory, because blocking the transit of these arms that are delivered to Ukraine would, in my uh, um, uh, opinion, create an impediment. So we had to create a legal basis to allow for the transit of these arms. And that was done, and I won't go into all the details, precisely on the basis of that Article 23G that I mentioned earlier on. So in reality, and I mean allowing for the transit of arms which are finally destined to Ukraine uh, is, exa is, uh, uh, is exactly a violation, uh, to be completely frank, of the duty of abstention that would normally apply uh, to a neutral country, as Mrs. Enos utterly explained. So we have a clear case here where under the Austrian constitutional legislation that we have, the obligations of solidarity within the European Union have taken priority over the classical obligations of neutrality. And I think this is a very important first step. Now, if you ask me what this means uh, for further developments in this field, I think it's no secret that we do not have a discussion uh, at all comparable to that in Sweden and Finland uh, right now. And I don't think that we will be going into that direction easily uh, because for all sorts of reasons, as uh, Dietmar already explained in his introduction, neutrality has become an emotional issue for many, uh, for many Austrians, and there's not really a willingness uh, in the Austrian public and even less in the Austrian political landscape uh, to discuss this in a confrontational manner. The next challenge that we will have, and that is my concluding point, is how we now deal with the future of the Austrian army. Because in fact, like everybody else, uh, we have also discovered with 
territorial war having become possible in Austria, and we can speak about the threat perception afterwards, we simply need to do, finally need to do more uh, for our defense forces. And the Austrian Minister of Defense has announced, and this has been generally supported, that the Austrian defense uh, budget will basically be tripled uh, in the next years from a ridiculous 0.5% to the GDP of something like 1.5% of GDP. Now, uh, of the, but now, of course, if that is our understanding, it would be quite useful to know as a first step what we will use that all that money for. And that, of course, requires some sort of reflection on what the future of our defense will look like. And in particular, when it comes to territorial defense, if we will do that on our own, or if we will do that in combination with others. And there, of course, we do have the mutual defense clause in Article 42.7 of the European Union Treaty, which we could rely on. But if we do that, we have a completely different type of structure of our armed forces, because they would have to be interoperational uh, in a manner uh, that uh, you would need to look at. And it would also open up all sorts of issues uh, on training. And there, by the way, uh, although the Austrian uh, debate is very carefully skirting around NATO and if at all only focusing on the European Union, I mean, everybody who knows about these things knows that territorial defense will remain for a long time the prerogative of NATO. And Article 47 of the European Union Treaty even says so explicitly in Article 47, uh, uh, 42, sorry, 7, that for member states of NATO, they will continue to do their collective defense commitments in the framework of NATO. So in a certain sense, this is also an issue about interoperability with NATO. It's also an issue about training with NATO, something that Sweden and Finland have done for many years, uh, including on Article 5 uh, scenarios. So all these questions arise. I don't expect dramatic changes in Austrian uh, security policy uh, in the months uh, and years to come, but some important decisions will need to be taken. And there is a certain level of unrest, I should, should say, amongst experts, uh, diplomats and others uh, at the sort of slowness uh, with which this discussion is progressing in Austria. I think that's what I can say now, and I'm happy to complement later on in our discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. Merci beaucoup. Uh, I'm afraid that my question for you will be the, roughly the same that the previous one. Will it be possible for in the future, considering the position taken by the European Union in the Ukrainian crisis, will it be possible, imaginable, that uh, to remain a member of the European Union uh, remaining neutral? What what does that uh, what does that mean? And uh, your last remark uh, uh, is very important. Uh, enhancing uh, a, a defense system uh, doesn't mean nothing um, out of a logic of operationality and interoperationality uh, of interoperationality and interoperationality means uh, a, a rapprochement with NATO uh, uh, or will or with countries members of the European Union who are mainly members of NATO. So that's the same thing. Uh, merci beaucoup. Thank you very much once more. I give the floor to Anna Oyanan now. Madame, je vous en prie, Madame le Professeur. You have the floor. Merci beaucoup. Uh, bonjour. Uh, good morning to everyone. And many thanks for the invitation to speak. Um, speaking from here in Helsinki, it is really uh, surprising uh, how quickly Finland and the other uh, Finnish people changed course and changed their mind and decided to join NATO. It was really quick and apparently also quite easy. And there is practically no crying over the end of non-alignments that one could hear now. There is one reason I would like to highlight uh, in particular that might explain this situation. And it is that in the Finnish case, neutrality and non-alignment have been instrumental in character. They have not really been a policy goal or a question of identity. And uh, this links to the broader thoughts on neutrality and non-alignment. As we already see now, there is a lot of variation in thinking, uh, a lot of variation as to what neutral and non-aligned countries mean with that policy, 
and why the policies are adopted in the first place. So, uh, instrumental in character, and one might add here only instrumental, but uh, perhaps that would be too dismissive. Even for Finland, neutrality and non-alignments have been important, perhaps even vital. And even for Finland, uh, they have come to be an important part of how the country and the people see themselves in international relations, and also how the rest of the world sees Finland. And this is why I think that this uh, step to NATO is at the same time a big step and a small step. It is big in the sense that it means a lasting change of policy, a, uh, a lasting change also of reference groups for Finland, something that has always been very important to be seen as part of the right company, so to say. So it is a, an end of an era. But in practice, it is a very small step, as Finland already was so close to NATO as an enhanced partner. Uh, so put really very simply, one could say that Russian behavior of late has changed so profoundly that Finland has needed to change the instruments of its security policy. And the new instrument is called NATO. Now, I'd like to go shortly back in time to uh, how it used to be and how Finnish thinking has related to more general ideas about neutrality. Now, one way of seeing neutrality is to look at it as a third way, perhaps, between two blocks, uh, between two blocks around two superpowers. Um, perhaps a third way with some morally strong ground, at least at times, uh, not being part of arms race or other rivalries. Uh, the Finnish experience, as you certainly know very well, starting from uh, 1948, was that of being tied into the security system of the Soviet Union by the Treaty of Friendship, Cooperation and Mutual Assistance. And there, Finland needed neutrality to be able to have some breathing space uh, or room for maneuver. Uh, it claimed to be neutral, but it got a formal recognition for its neutrality by the Soviet Union only in 1989. Anyway, uh, the Finnish way of being neutral, it was to build good relations to uh, the Soviet Union, to the East, in order to have the possibility of building the necessary relations with the West. But Finland was really very cautious. And we see this in an interesting way in Finland's, in the way Finland approached different international organizations. Uh, Finland couldn't join the United Nations nor the Nordic Council before uh, 1955 uh, with uh, the uh, some detente that we had at that point. Finland did not join EFTA uh, as such. It uh, signed a special Fin-EFTA treaty with the other EFTA countries to tailor that um, treaty or organization in a way that was found suitable with its position. Um, it had to see to all possible mm, ways in which the organizations were related to the West, so to say, and be careful uh, not to commit itself to too much. It did not join the Council, the Council of Europe at all. It joined only uh, in uh, 1989. And the free trade agreements with the EEC were accompanied by theoretically similar agreements with the Eastern Bloc. Um, neutrality came to have something to do with all kinds, all forms of policy and trade. And in many fields, uh, there was this kind of symmetry in theory. For instance, Finland bought nuclear power plants, both from the East and from the West. 
Then, uh, with the uh, conference on security and cooperation uh, in Europe, uh, that was in Helsinki in 1975, Finland perhaps started to get more of an internationally active role. And similarly, uh, the UN peacekeeping activities were something that suited Finland well. It was an activity where being small and being neutral uh, provided uh, a good reputation and also uh, something where a good reference group could be found, um, constituted by countries like Sweden and Ireland. Neutrality had a, that positive image attached to it. So the core of neutrality, that was the idea of room for maneuver or freedom of movement. But there is another side of the question that needs to be remembered. The core of the Finnish idea of neutrality was that Finland keeps out of the conflicts between the great powers. Uh, and this was also interpreted as keeping a certain distance from both the Soviet Union and the United States. Um, then at the end of the Cold War, as we know, meant quite a change to this. Finland decided to join the EU following Sweden. Uh, and uh, its first contacts with the new NATO councils that NATO had for countries interested in membership. Uh, the first contacts were made already in 1991 in the uh, North Atlantic Cooperation Council, the NACC. Um, then followed an interesting major step towards partnering with the United States, and that was the, the, the deal to buy the Hornet F-18 uh, uh, fighters in 1992. That was a surprise for many, uh, because earlier on in this field, as well as so many other fields, the policy had been to buy both from the East and from the West, in this case buying both uh, Soviet and Swedish fighters. But now, in the end, uh, Finland only bought four nets. Uh, and this was really new and led, obviously, to closer links with the United States. With the EU membership, um, neutrality was abandoned. And the Finnish policy now was called military and non-alignment, a very important distinction uh, for us. Uh, Finland recognized that uh, and saw that, the, um, that a neutral past could be a problem when entering the EU. And uh, some old member states at that time even had the idea of perhaps not letting these countries have a say in the CFSP at all. Uh, what followed in, in reality was the uh, declaration that Ambassador Meyer Harting was already referring to. Um, Finland thus felt it needs to show that neutrality belongs to the past, that, that there has been a change, that it would be active and constructive while militarily non aligned. And so Finland, together with Sweden again, tried to do their best for EU crisis management in particular. Finland also put a lot of stress on solidarity from the very start. Uh, it was saying that the EU is a security community. Perhaps this was a way of saying that the EU could be a kind of new instrument for Finland in its uh, security policy. But it took some time before the other EU member countries were uh, following that line. Um, in addition to EU membership, there has been um, another line of change that has become more and more important recently. And that has been the change in Finnish security and defense policy, which is more and more explicitly relying on cooperation with other countries. Uh, it used to be defined as credible national defense. Um, again, for reasons that we already had the chance of hearing more uh, today. Uh, but from credible national defense, the, uh, the, the description has become more a uh, web of uh, cooperation agreements on cooperation in security and defense, different bilateral, trilateral, multilateral agreements with different countries. 
a disparu. So uh, now, however, it is all about NATO. Uh, we have had a discussion about NATO always, uh, one could say, but it has usually been somehow cut short or postponed, and it has always ended in saying that we have the option of joining if we decide, but this is not the right moment to join, till very recently, obviously. And so in the past three to four months, we have observed a opinion poll earthquake on NATO, uh, which used to be 25% um, for membership, is now 25% against even and so we saw the actual membership application a week ago uh, it was preceded by a lot of diplomacy uh, and has led to many different signs of support and solidarity from uh, various NATO countries uh, for instance a political declaration with the United Kingdom on uh, mutual support in case of aggression what was what changed finally? Um, basically, there was a new need to react to Russia with something that is important enough. The, the Russian actions have been such that the, the response from the Finnish side needs to be remarkable and needs to be outstanding in a way, such as a complete policy reversal in a sense and also going explicitly against what Russia was uh, advising. At the same time, it is important to see that we have some elements of continuity, particularly when it comes to the way all this is argued for. So the, uh, the discourse, in a sense, uh, doesn't change that much. Above all, the idea of a uh, room for maneuver is still there, only that now it is best guaranteed by NATO. The latest Finnish government reports uh, on changes in the security environment makes this explicit now aside from that report, a situation where Russia aims to build a sphere of influence through demands and military means, failing to react to the changes in the security environment could lead to changes in Finland's international position and a narrowing of Finland's room for maneuver. So there needs to be a reaction, and that is uh, NATO uh, membership. But even the positive image factor is still there, now only increased by NATO. Uh, the president uh, of the Republic, uh, Sauli Niinistö, underlined in March that NATO not only has uh, deterrence uh, potential, but it is also likely to have a positive impact on international perceptions of Finland. So the, uh, the arguments are still there and have not changed so much. So uh, where should we conclude at this point? I think to put it very shortly, in the case of Finland, it, it looks that like the that NATO fitted in as a, a new instrument of security policy with surprising ease. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam. Uh, uh, thank you for those uh, precisions on the Finnish case. Maybe we, you, you, you will uh, give us some details on the uh, uh, change uh, uh, in your military forces that will be uh, uh, produced by uh, the, the, the next adhesion, and particularly considering the eventual, the possible uh, uh, reaction of Russia uh, with new deployments uh, uh, close to your frontier. Uh, what will uh, be the, uh, the consequences on, uh, for example, deployment of troops uh, in Finland and so on? Um, thank you very much. Uh, last but not least, uh, if there is one uh, neutral left in Europe, I suppose it will be Switzerland, uh, Monsieur l'Ambassadeur. So you, the floor is yours. Merci beaucoup. Je suis pas tout à fait sûr. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Happy to be here. Uh, I will start out with two citations. The first goes, even Switzerland stands with Ukraine today. 
President Biden said that in a little aside when he had a big press conference on international sanctions. The second citation is a, a little less complimentary. And I cite, Swiss lawyers and bankers to the Russian rich have not been idle. That was the Financial Times. Ladies and gentlemen, you will see from that that I will concentrate on the practical side of uh, Swiss neutrality. How does it look like now after what we call in the German-speaking countries of, Swiss, of uh, Europe and its Zeitenwende? How does it look like when even Switzerland has realized that all on its own, it cannot security policy-wise go further? My presentation is in three parts. What is Swiss neutrality today? The second is the individual parts of Swiss neutrality. And the third is now what? Where we go from now? What is Swiss neutrality today? The concept of neutrality, ladies and gentlemen, today in the Europe of the European Union is dead, quite simply dead. It was in the interest of Europe in the 19th century, in the 20th century, but at the very least, at the end of the Cold War, the, uh, the importance of neutrality as such, including Swiss neutrality for the outside world, has ceased to exist, except, for exa except of course, in the case of the Ukraine war for Russia, who would have hoped that Switzerland would take a position which actually would have not been neutral. Because if we hadn't taken on the uh, same sanction that the European Union decided on, we would have been, in fact, uh, supportive of Russia. Some negative sides of Swiss neutrality, of course, linger on, go on as the second uh, citation showed very clearly, and I'll come back to it. How does Swiss neutrality today look in Switzerland? This neutrality over the years has become very much of a national myth in Switzerland. We are neutral because we are always neutral. It is a very emotional uh, uh, thing in Switzerland, just as our colleague from uh, Austria said that. The point of departure in Switzerland uh, when confronted with a foreign policy problem is always, we are neutral, but of course, we are against injustice just like anybody else. Does, does that have to change? It probably will. But let me first look at the individual parts of uh, Swiss neutrality. The first one is economic neutrality. As I already said, economic neutrality in the Ukraine war is, of course, non-existent and has to be non-existent for any kind of democratic uh, law-abiding country. And Switzerland uh, counts itself very much among that uh, European core and, and at the core of these countries all over the world. Russian economic interests in Switzerland are quite important. It's not always realized or only in pointed comments, like the one I cited, that we are actually what we call in German ein Schwergewicht, a, a poids lourd, where our economic interaction with Russia and Russians are very important. 80% of Russian uh, raw material exports are being traded through Switzerland. Of course, they will not, they do not come physically to Switzerland, but they're traded by trading firms, especially in Geneva and in uh, Zug, that little Swiss uh, canton, which is especially famous for having very low taxes. But also in wealth management, uh, Russian interests in Switzerland are quite, uh, are quite big. And uh, the Swiss Banking Association, at the very beginning of the Ukrainian war, has cited a figure of roughly 200 billion uh, Swiss francs, which is about the same as, as, as euros and dollars, at that uh, of, of, of wealth of Russia and Russians in Switzerland, especially, of course, Russians. So far, not even 10 billions of those have been sequestered by the Swiss government. And actually, the figure is going down right now because our authorities say that some of these uh, restrictions have been applied to the wrong people. Switzerland could 
clearly do more in that respect. And he's also asked, after the ritual thanks for what Switzerland has done, and it has done some things, be it in Davos right now or somewhere else, is always, well, um, could you please see to it that the Russian wealth in Switzerland is also being seized? We have a bit of a problem with this because under Swiss law, it's not the state that goes to the banks, to the financial intermediaries, to others who might manage Russian wealth, but it's rather the other way around. These actors have to report back to the government how much Russian assets they hold. That is not so easy because these Russian assets have already before the war, but especially since the very first hours of the war, been hidden, put into foreign trusts and so forth and so on. But basically, there is a certain truth in saying in, in what is being said abroad that Switzerland should do a, a little bit more. The question right now in that respect is, should Switzerland join the bodies both in the EU and in the US who actively go after Russian uh, assets? Second part after the economic neutrality, the security policy. Now, the call went up in Switzerland, of course, too. Security policy-wise, we cannot go on like this. Alone, we are clearly too weak. Uh, Switzerland might not have a border with uh, Ukraine and even less with Russia, but it was clearly realized that we cannot go on, 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 we cannot go on, on like we have before. And uh, uh, our colleague Thomas Meyer-Harting said, uh, Austria has increased its defense budget from, I quote, ridiculous 0.5 and wants to triple it. We had the same percentage with all the uh, famous or not famous uh, reputation of the Swiss army that goes back way into the Middle Ages. But you wonder whether it's still true nowadays. We have clearly had, uh, we clearly profited from that much cited peace dividend after the uh, Cold War and have also reduced our military uh, expenditures. This has already been corrected. The government or rather the parliament has, uh, the government and the parliament have decided to markedly increase our uh, uh, budget. Except I'll have to say for our nationalist rights. Politically, our nationalist right is quite important. It's quite, quite simply the largest party in Switzerland. It participates in the government and they like to say, no, Switzerland, like we've always done, we should continue as that famous armed porcupine who defends himself. Further part of what Swiss neutrality is today would be those good offices. Good offices, ladies and gentlemen, nowadays are clearly done by those who have both the means and have eventual uh, levers, have eventual pressure points towards the two parties that want to have good offices between them. What, what would I want to say with this? In the case of the Ukraine war, it's the NATO member Turkey, if anybody, who could possibly do something between Ukraine and Russia because they have and had uh, also military relations with both sides. Turkey can do things against Russia in the Black Sea. Other countries who have furnished good offices, the one who was absolutely leading in this is Norway, NATO member Norway, who had both the money and the good diplomacy to do this. We did some, we had some uh, Swiss in international uh, good offices positions, but it's clearly not absolutely necessary to uh, to do good offices, to be neutral. How about protection mandates? We have some of them. Um, right now, it appears that the Ukraine is discussing with Switzerland whether Switzerland should take a position towards Russia the way Georgia has asked Switzerland to be uh, a protective power or a, a power that takes 
the uh, diplomatic, uh, it, it takes care of the diplomatic relations with a country where there are no direct relations any longer. Georgia has asked that after the two, uh, 2014 invasion of Georgia. So the good of the, the, those protection mandates, those good offices with regard to, uh, to uh, uh, representation do exist, but there are many other countries involved in this. Again, neutrality is not necessarily part of it, even though it might sometimes help a little bit. Seat of international organizations, as again, Thomas Mayer Harting has said, uh, Vienna is now uh, an important UN seat, just like Geneva. In the case of Geneva, it's also tradition. Geneva has already been the seat of the League of Nations. That had to do with the, your, Europe at the end of the, se of the First World War. And so to continue with that UN seat right after the Second World War in Geneva was quite simply practical because the buildings were already there. Uh, I come to probably the most sticky point or, or rather what is considered in Switzerland the most sticky point about neutrality today, Swiss neutrality today. The Swiss constitution, ladies and gentlemen, does only very marginally say we are neutral, very marginally. In all the main articles in the Swiss constitution on uh, foreign policy, what should be our position in the world. Neutrality is not mentioned. It's mentioned way back in the constitution among the tools, as Hanna Oyan said so good, the instruments of foreign policy, but not the purpose of foreign policy. In that sense, the Swiss constitution is probably, is not only probably, is less restrictive than the Austrian uh, uh, the Austin Federal Constitution, we know, of course, very well, because, uh, well, uh, we have already heard that uh, Austrian neutrality had to be taken after the Second World War. International law. We heard from Sophia a very interesting and very informative uh, uh, resume what, in, what neutrality means in international law, but it's very important to say that neutrality is self-imposed. A country is neutral because it wants to be neutral. Of course, once you're not neutral any longer, you have to tell everybody uh, we've taken this and this kind of foreign policy uh, that has changed, etc. But it's very important to say and in Switzerland, that is not understood by a wide part, even of the population, that there is no international obligation imposed from the outside of being neutral. We are neutral because we want to be neutral. That can change basically whenever we want. Third part of what I wanted to say, what now? NATO, EU, for more, uh, more allied, for more connected security policy profile of Switzerland. As I said in the beginning, there is a realization in Switzerland too that the Zeitenwende Ukraine, Ukraine war has changed things. NATO, interestingly enough, NATO that before the Ukraine war was always, was hardly ever mentioned in the Swiss context. Now, all of a sudden, a bit like Sweden and Finland, but of course not with the same consequences, is now in the middle of the discussion. Uh, what can we do to get closer to NATO? And again, with the exception of the nationalist right in, in Switzerland, everybody asks that question. We are members since quite a long time, since the 90s of Partnership for Peace in NATO and do a few things there. But if we really want to go a step further and beyond all these, uh, there, there are lots of special uh, construction or uh, word construction here. Uh, there is um, uh, the, the, the Partnership Inter operability initiative, this enhanced opportunity partners initiative. But we have to realize, and I think in Switzerland that realization is sinking in, if you want to, to move closer to NATO, closer than the partnership for peace, it means common armament, uh, common procurement, maybe not common armament, common procurement, common training, common exercises and common structures. Is Switzerland really ready for that? The internal discussion about what it means in particular, a bit in parallel with Austria, has really not been uh, 
done or has not been, the discussion has not been had in Switzerland. Should we get closer to the EU? And I'm not even talking of joining the EU. That's a whole big party, ugly, difficult discuss discussion in Switzerland. But can we not, as as we are right now, very much part of the EU, but not formally, formally a member, can we move closer to security profile of the EU? That's not very much en vogue, even in Brussels. I heard from people in Brussels that, of course, the um, right now NATO is in the midst of all intention. But ladies and gentlemen, I don't have to tell you, NATO carries a few, uh, a few impediments with it. What if Trumpism coming back in, in, in the United States? And even not, how about the US pivot to Asia, et cetera? It's clear that Europe within NATO and or elsewhere has to do more for its security. Here, there would be possibilities for Switzerland. Uh, for example, uh, I think it was Karl Bildt, the former Swedish uh, prime minister, who pointed out there's an article 42.7 in the EU treaties that is, in fact, quite similar to, pa to the para five, uh, paragraph 5 of the NATO Charta. It's not being much discussed right now, but in the mid and in the longer term, uh, there are some people in Switzerland, not everybody, who says we should first do more closeness to the EU in security policy and probably in parallel see what we can do uh, with NATO. But most of all, it's an internal discussion. We have a tendency in Switzerland to always uh, do some navel gazing, to look at ourselves and then discuss with ourselves. So as a conclusion, I would say, don't expect Switzerland to say, in the very in, in the future, in the very near future, we're not neutral any longer. But actually, as things goes, as Europe develops, as the Ukraine cre uh, Ukraine war becomes more evident, uh, as aggression in Europe has come back, we are no longer neutral. As Switzerland and as Sweden and Finland chose, things can change very quickly. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Monsieur, Mr. Ambassador. I'm, I'm not absolutely sure that your, the last presentation clarifies very well the conceptual problems of neutrality. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you are neutral, but you are no more neutral. So my first question, uh, opening the, 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 uh, a new round of, uh, uh, between, between the panelists, my first question will be very simple. What is left of neutrality precisely in Europe? It's not only a theoretical question. Do you think that we have to define some new sort of neutrality or uh, to get rid of the notion? That's my, my, my first question. My, my second question is, is a, a remark. I'll give you a secret. When we have thought of this uh, uh, panel, uh, the first question in our mind was the future of Ukraine. Because uh, uh, some weeks ago, the question was to define uh, some sort of status uh, uh, for, for the future, future Ukraine, uh, um, uh, no NATO, etc. You, you, you know, you know the, 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 and, and I'm very struck by the fact that uh, practically no one mentioned this problem. So, uh, uh, is this, the, are these notions of neutrality or non alignment still pertinent? at least partially to think some sort of future for Ukraine or not. I'm, I know it's an enormous problem, but maybe you can uh, make some uh, allusion to that. So I, I suggest uh, one more remark uh, for the external participants. Please write your questions and I, I, I take uh, them into account, uh, of course. So uh, could you react to the presentations of the other panelists and to some, some questions maybe right by those presentations, including, for example, including, uh, of course, uh, Dietmar, if you have something to, <laughs> to suggest now. Now, Dietmar. Uh, Madame Meno Satali, would you react first to, to, to those uh, uh, remarks and presentations? Yes, yeah, sure, thanks. Um, my first remark uh, would be that uh, in the past, neutrality was considered as a good solution 
for small states, uh, first for small states that uh, wanted to, um, to assert that sovereignty towards, for example, a former dominant power, such as uh, Ireland, towards uh, Britain and Malta also, and of course, uh, in a way, Finland uh, towards Russia, or the USSR, sorry. And um, usually when we thought about neutrality, it was considered as a good solution for countries which were located in buffer zones between um, two uh, great powers, uh, two um, blocks, two rival blocks. And um, as um, the ambassador Thomas Meherting uh, mentioned it, uh, this was uh, relevant for Austria during the Cold War, which was between uh, NATO members and between uh, members of the Pact of the of the, uh, the Warsaw Pact. Sorry, uh, the Warsaw Pact. So it used to be considered as relevant for small countries that were under the circumstances needing to assert its sovereignty toward a former dominant power or being uh, for countries con constituting uh, buffer countries between our two, uh, two rival blocks. So um, yes, uh, in the framework uh, of uh, the European Union, um, neutrality today doesn't make sense uh, because as it was uh, mainly mentioned because of the Article 42.7 uh, of the EU Treaty, uh, which uh, which uh, which is yes quite similar uh, to the Article Five of uh, military uh, of the the alliance, the NATO sorry of NATO and um, and especially on a geopolitical point of view I mean uh, I think with Britain uh, Ireland has asserted its sovereignty towards Great Britain and um, uh, Austria is not and is not more uh, a buffer country between uh, two blocks. It's in the middle of, the, of NATO. And um, so regarding Ukraine, because your question was uh, also in the end about uh, Ukraine, um, I think that uh, in a way, Ukraine a few weeks ago could be seen as yes, between two um, Blocks. I mean, the NATO one and Russia on the other hand. But uh, once more, and uh, it was very important, uh, Daniel Volker um, underlined it. Uh, neutrality has always been uh, an act of sovereignty, you know. And so, uh, uh, since uh, it's not the choice of Ukraine, neutrality, uh, the neutrality of Ukraine is not uh, an issue. Thank you very much, uh, Monsieur Monsieur Ambassador, uh, Monsieur Ambassador May Harting. Uh, may I add uh, one more question, which is, which is arrived on my uh, uh, in my office uh, by Guido Lenzi, who was uh, who used to be the uh, director of the uh, w, WEU Institute uh, in Paris. Ambassador May Harting, you skipped over <laughs> the, 90, uh, a, the 89 Portsas Declaration by uh, the EU Defense Minister, an initiative that Austria took in joining the EU, which led to the EU taking over defense metra from the Western uh, European Union. I think you mentioned that uh, with the article of Lisbon Treaty, but uh, the question is, is for you. Um, well, thank you very much. In fact, I answered that question directly to Mr. Lindsay in the meantime. Okay. I sent him a note. Okay. I mean, basically, uh, <laughs> the Bachach was uh, very much a product of the declaration of Saint-Malo at the time and of France and the United Kingdom. But it is true that uh, during that presidency, we also organized the first ever informal meeting of ministers of defense of the European Union. So it's true that Austria tried to promote this uh, European dimension over time. Uh, I would say that um, when I was involved in the discussions in the 90s of whether Austria should move away from neutrality, the basic question was whether membership in the European Union and membership in NATO, that is to say full Euro-Atlantic integration, are not basically two parts, two sides of the same medal. And following, obviously, the enlargement in 2004, uh, um, where 
all the uh, basically everyone uh, with the exception of, of Cyprus and Malta who are very specific cases again uh, was member of the European Union and, and NATO this strengthened this whole discussion and I do think that with what is happening in Finland and Sweden right now you're back to that discussion again and I think that Professor Oyan was very clear about the NATO priority uh, in the perception the security uh, perception of Finland right now and I also think that what we are seeing in Ukraine including the reaction by international partners, has probably strengthened uh, the Atlantic dimension uh, of Euro-Atlantic uh, uh, security. But uh, Austria was not ready uh, to go down that path. And I mean, I take note of the tremendous change that has taken place in public opinion uh, in Finland, but we are still around those 15 or 20 percent uh, maximum uh, in favor of uh, uh, NATO membership and 80 percent in favor of maintaining neutrality. Can you remain neutral within the European Union uh, today? Legally, uh, the uh, I mean, the, the preconditions are there. I mean, with this sort of Irish clause that I referred to, with the fact that it doesn't oblige you uh, to be a member uh, of an alliance when you join uh, the European Union. And that's why we, uh, why we sort of limited our neutrality to what we call the core, that is to say, non-membership in a military alliance, non-stationing of uh, uh, troops, uh, foreign troops on our territory, and non-participation in wars. And as far as the last point is concerned, uh, allowing for the transit of arms uh, to Ukraine uh, under a strict uh, concept of law of neutrality is in a certain sense already participation indirectly at least uh, in, in a war. And therefore I think we have limited uh, uh, the effects of our neutrality. I think we can continue to do that even more. And I think we will do so. Uh, the, 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 the truth of the Austrian situation is that we continue to call everything we do neutrality, uh, but we have readapted it uh, to the circumstances. And I think to move that step that we don't call it neutrality anymore, that will be a very difficult step vis-a-vis -vis the Austrian public, but to move on uh, with a greater, um, with greater um, integration one way or the other, I think that is something that may well happen. I do in fact have a question uh, to uh, Mr. Walker, uh, to Ambassador Walker, uh, uh, because I was fascinated, frankly, more than by the Finnish discussion, because I mean, everybody understands the specificity of Finnish geopolitics. From an Austrian viewpoint, I was fascinated uh, by the Swiss discussion and I heard things like, I mean, if you uh, uh, basically, I think the, it was the leader of the Liberal Party in Switzerland, the president of the Liberal Party, who basically said, if you're neutral and if you're attacked, the moment you're attacked, the obligations of neutrality are dropped because once you're attacked, you can defend yourself whichever way you, uh, you find useful, find allies wherever you can find them. And what the president of the Liberal Party basically was said was that if that's the case, we have to prepare for this situation already now. I mean, implicitly, he said the only logical ally in that sort of scenario would be NATO. And therefore, it would be logical that we start practicing with NATO now uh, for a situation of territory defense. I mean, and that I have to say, I found a fascinating, a fascinating comment. And that goes beyond the kind of discussion that we have in Austria uh, at this point in time. So I do have to say, um, I would be keen uh, to hear, hear more about that. As far as our future participation in the European structures are concerned, I think the, 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 the dilemma that we are facing is that it's easier in the Austrian uh, discussion to move along uh, the European Union channel than along the NATO channel. I mean, it's it's much easier in Austria to say we will move forward on Austrian security uh, on European security and defense than to say that we're getting closer to NATO. But in real terms, when it comes to territorial uh, uh, defense, I think uh, right now uh, um, developments in Ukraine have rather strengthened uh, the uh, the role of of NATO in the overall structure, as I already said. And finally, just a brief comment to your question on. Ukraine, obviously, it's for the Ukrainians uh, to decide uh, what they want. Uh, my impression uh, in whatever I've heard uh, from the Ukrainian side until now is that they're not so much interested in the legal complexities of neutrality uh, in the way we know it. What they're interested in are in security guarantees. So what they have, uh, that what they have asked for is uh, basically a guaranteed neutrality. This is something that in the case of Austria was thought about in 
five, but never realized, which in, in, at the end of the day is a good thing, because having uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the permanent members of the Security Council, and in particular Russia or the Soviet Union, as a guarantor of Austrian neutrality, would rather have complicated uh, our situation after 1955. So I think, but that I think is what they're interested in, security guarantees. And if that can be sort of provided under the cloak of something that is called neutrality, they might be interested, but I don't think they follow the sophistication of the Austrian or, or Swiss or constitutional discussion on the finesses of neutrality. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, uh, we will uh, wait a few minutes uh, before the answer of Ambassador Boker, because I give the floor to, to Hada Hoshanan. Uh, uh, I noticed that uh, uh, um, you know that in France uh, the, the the expression of Euro uh, Euro Atlantic institution is not much uh, uh, has never been much liked, but uh, I'm I'm uh, I'm afraid we are more and more lonely uh, in this in this detestation. Uh, I add to that the the, the question of uh, uh, from uh, from another Frenchman Denis Veret who is who is writing France is supposed to be allied, but not aligned. Um, who are the other EU member states uh, on the same line sharing this strategy? I'm not sure we are so many uh, on this line. But uh, for other remarks, uh, uh, Professor Yannan, please. Thank you. Thank you very much for the, uh, for the questions. And uh, I think uh, two, uh, two small observations and then a couple of answers to uh, the questions you posed before. Um, it just, uh, I was just thinking uh, when discu discussing uh, neutrality in broader terms that uh, the, the need for neutrality to be respected by others uh, may have also to do with the overall uh, situation when it comes to international norms and rules and whether they are respected or not. Um, and there we might see a, a difficult uh, situation now more than before. And on Ukraine, uh, we already heard important uh, uh, ideas on that. I think that any um, closer relation between uh, Ukraine and and the EU, uh, something close to membership, um, may quite naturally include security and even defense policy kind of parts. And also we need to think about how the EU-NATO relationship evolves and what that means uh, in the long run. When it comes to the more specific questions uh, about the uh, the consequences of the, the current changes in Finland for the military and the Russian reactions. These are exactly the questions that are debated here every day for, from morning to evening. Um, the, the changes in the military, they are not big. And as we heard from Ambassador Walker when he was speaking about what, the, what closer forms of cooperation there are in NATO, uh, that is exactly how our situation was. So all that training exercises, uh, cooperation was already there. And so from there to membership uh, doesn't change that much. More people will be working for NATO in the headquarters. Uh, there will be, of course, common planning and uh, intelligence sharing. Uh, that we didn't have, but the practical changes are not that much. There is the interesting uh, example of, of uh, that we had some problems with the uh, NATO-related trainings where Article 5 was somehow invoked. Uh, they were problematic, but of course they won't be problematic any longer. Um, when, when it comes to the Russian reactions really shortly, um, Russia promised um, all kinds of uh, reactions, um, these famous military technical ones, and people were, were uh, preparing for all kinds of eventuali eventualities, uh, cyber uh, attacks and things like that. 
but uh, the most recent reaction has been quite mm, moderate. Uh, it has been more or less like, okay, um, we'll see what NATO membership will mean in concrete terms, and then there will be a response. So if there were to be more troops in Finland, then Russia would place more troops near the Finnish border, for instance. Um, but that would be the, uh, the situation now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sir. Ambassador Rocker, now it's time to answer to Ambassador May Arting and to the others, please. Uh, thank you. I'll take the question in the succession that they were asked. Do we need, um, uh, Dominique, you asked, do we need a new definition of neutrality? And uh, not with regard to the traditional four neutrals uh, in Europe. It, it, as I said, that is a historical concept. It just doesn't apply in the Europe of the European Union. Switzerland was neutral when its immediate neighbors fought against each other. And already for our internal cohesion, we're a multi multilingual country, as everybody knows, we had to be neutral. But this has totally changed. A war between Germany and uh, France, not even after a final in soccer world championship, is totally impossible, excluded. We need... Uh, a new definition probably of neutrality, but we can't call it neutrality with regard to, uh, with regard to Ukraine. Indeed, um, it, whatever comes out of this war, there will be some sort of a de facto non-alignment in, in Ukraine, at least uh, unless there are very drastic changes in Russia. So I would not say that neutrality as a general uh, concept, in, in other words, too, would not apply, but not for the four traditional neutrals. The, uh, 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 Thomas has very uh, elegantly said, uh, or has very presented the very elegant uh, a Austrian way, we just don't talk of neutrality any longer. We know it's very much anchored in the Austrian population, but we actually change policy. That we tried to do in Switzerland. In Switzerland, of course, the additional problem is always our referendas, when uh, especially our nationalist rights, right, who is against all involvement uh, with, uh, with uh, countries abroad, except when it brings economic uh, advantages. They can always take an initiative, what we call a popular initiative, take a referenda against a majority uh, decision of the Swiss Parliament. So that's a real, uh, real problem. To that last question of uh, Thomas, uh, what about the president uh, of the Liberal Party? He has exactly said what you said. Uh, he, just like in Finland or in Sweden, a couple of months ago, this would have been impossible for them to talk seriously about joining, uh, joining NATO. It would have been impossible in Switzerland for middle of the road parties, it wasn't only the Liberal Party, it was also what we call now the Mitte, the, the, the Middle Party, which is the, the old Christian Democratic Party, have both asked for definite clo a definite closer relationship with NATO. They always add, almost ritually, almost Pavlovian. Yes, but of course we stay neutral. No, we don't. As Sophie said, and, and others have said, Hannah, uh, Hannah has al also mentioned it, um, it, there are quite a lot of ways to get closer to NATO, but you join NATO and you're not neutral any longer in the classical definition as Sophie has lined it out. Uh, the problem is in this within Switzerland, a little bit like in Austria, the, the population believes in neutrality and everybody believes in its own neutrality. The banker likes to do business with everybody. Companies like to export with, with uh, very few obstacles, etc. But it has neutrality in the Swiss, uh, in, in the Swiss internal discussion has become what we call in German eine leere Worthülse, an empty shell that everybody fills with him, his or her 
own notion of neutrality. So I'd say in looking at Europe, neutrality or rather non-alignment is not dead, as we've seen now with in the case of Ukraine, it could all of a sudden pop up again as a possible solution to a crisis. But with regard to the, four, the traditional neutrals, the Ukraine war has changed everything. Thank you very much. Dietmar, would you like to, to add something? Well, I, I think it was a very fascinating discussion because it, uh, clearly it shows to what extent uh, the concept of neutrality has, has shifted uh, and, and been reinterpreted over time. So obviously we have a situation where two Nordic countries, Sweden and Finland, made the decision to join NATO. We also have a situation where it would be impossible in the near future, I think, if I interpret Ambassador Walker and Ambassador Mayerati correctly, to, to take that decision anytime soon. But on the other hand, one of the issues which, which remains is um, to what extent uh, neutrality can be sort of interpreted in a way where it doesn't really de detract from, from, from the concept of solidarity which I think has moved to the forefront and which was in classical terms, never really associated uh, to, to neutrality. The, the other question I think, which was mentioned also, but not discussed in, in full is that it, it, it will of course be easier in the Austrian context to discuss security policy in the framework of the European Union. Now, what came out of the discussion also very clearly is when it comes to territorial defense, we are talking about NATO and anything which we do within the framework of the European Union is not really covering that in any meaningful way detached from, from NATO. But it might be an avenue basically to link the two in, in a way which we have not been able to do in, in the past. Uh, I think any discussion in Austria, probably also in Switzerland, which really sort of opposes the two ends, neutrality versus NATO, uh, is not very productive. But if we can frame it in other ways of saying that, yes, but there are ways of cooperating. What Thomas mentioned about this concept discussed in, in, in Switzerland by the president of the Liberal Party, uh, if you take your defense seriously, uh, then you have to prepare for the worst case. And this can only be done if you also look obviously for support and allies, also based on uh, Article 51 of the uh, Charter of the United Nations. So I think this discussion is in flux, uh, but it will not be an easy one, certainly not if I look at it uh, from an Austrian perspective. And of course, we haven't even started to discuss the discussion uh, in the three other neutrals uh, or non-aligned, uh, Ireland, Malta and, and Cyprus, so I think. That would be interesting also for a follow-up. Thank you. Thank you, Dietmar. I, 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 I'm afraid I will add a, a, a rude and French question. Uh, rapprochement with NATO means rapprochement with the US uh, because the US are the basis and the center of the military system of, uh, of NATO. Uh, in that context, do you think that the future will uh, uh, let uh, some chance to the definition of a more specific and more uh, reinforced uh, uh, posi collective position of the Europeans within NATO, or is it uh, also to be uh, to be forgotten? Thomas Meyer-Harting was also ambassador to NATO, so he would like to say something. Well, I'm it. not sure that I'm, I'm qualified on that basis to speak about discussion amongst NATO members. Uh, I do think that it's an interesting dimension. I think the real problem is, to be honest, that um, developing the European security dimension as everything that happens in the European Union is based on, would, would need to be based in particular on Franco-German leadership. And I think to be a little more direct than I've been so far, that the experience of the uh, international reaction to what is happening in Ukraine has not necessarily been that the main factor in keeping Ukraine going has been uh, Franco-German leadership, uh, to be honest. I mean, uh, and uh, if you look at the reaction of the of the Germans, if you uh, not, if you look at the reaction in 
particular of our Eastern Euro or Central European partners. Uh, if you look at the role that the United Kingdom, regrettably no longer a member of the European Union, is playing right now, there's this whole dimension. And if you look at the Finnish and Swedish decision, I think everybody is saying, including in Austrian newspapers, that these two countries have come to the conclusion that Article 5, when it comes to territorial uh, defense, uh, is, uh, uh, is a safer guarantee uh, than Article 42, uh, uh, 7 of the European Union Treaty. So I think that um, uh, developing the European dimension in security requires will uh, amongst European Union member states, and in particular amongst those who are the leaders in so many other issues, uh, France and also Germany. And I think we're following the very convoluted uh, discussion that Germany is having, uh, to put it uh, carefully, uh, on, on, the, on, the, on the Ukrainian issue, which in many ways is similar uh, to the, uh, to, uh, at a different level uh, to the Austrian discussion, because, I mean, we have the same historical baggage uh, that we carry with us, the same reactions, etc. And I would say that in the broader Austrian public, uh, there is undoubtedly a certain sympathy uh, with many of the German reactions, but it's not necessarily, I mean, the, uh, the, 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 the discussion that helps on moving Europe forward in the field of security. I got another question. I saw that, if I may answer that briefly, on what could be done uh, to promote uh, a discussion in Austria as it happened in the 90s. I mean, I know, I'm not sure about the examples of the 90s, but what I find uh, interesting is the experience that Austria had in the 80s when we discussed membership in the European Union. Because in reality, when we started out in the first half of the 80s, there was less support uh, for membership in the European Union than there is even now when it comes to discussing membership in NATO. And I was certainly amongst all the Austrian diplomats at, of the time, and I think Dietmar as well, who probably said publicly that it was impossible for a neutral country uh, to become a member of the European Union. And we then went through this entire uh, experience of discussing with the, with the public. And we had a period in the 80s when the Austrian government, because its, uh, its leaders at the time, the foreign minister and Chancellor Vranitsky, Foreign Minister Mook and Chancellor Vranitsky, firmly believed that this is, this is the way that Austria had to go, that they went through a major effort uh, to influence Austrian public opinion. And this sort of then was then taken up by, the, by practically everybody who had a role in Austria. And, uh, and this then changed public perception dramatically. This has not happened so far in the field of security policy. And if you ask me why, I think the answer is that in the 80s, it was considered an existential question for the future of Austria, whether Austria becomes a member of the European Union or not. And, uh, and this, because it was considered an existential question, we had that strong support in government in moving the Austrian public. In the case of security policy, I don't think that even the Aust anybody in the Austrian leadership believes that it's an ex existential question for Austria, whether we join a military alliance or not, because the general feeling is we can solve the problem in other ways as well. And as long as this uh, perception prevails, we will not have a comparable effort uh, to the one that we had in, 80s for, in the 80s for the European Union. Thank you very much. Some more remarks, comments? Monsieur Ambassador, je vous en prie. Ambassador Volker. Thank you. Uh, I saw that um, since Thomas took up one of up one of the questions on the on the question and answer, I saw a question: Can Switzerland mediate between Russia and Ukraine? The very short answer: We are starting to run out of time. Is mediation no? Representation yes. Mediation is impossible, at least at this time, and Switzerland is certainly not in the best position to do it. it would, they, what is needed is people who have real leverage on both sides. We don't. They already talk. They can talk to each other whenever they want. They have channels of discussion, etc. They have also very powerful country that can help them in that. But representation, absolutely. As I said, um, the Ukraine is thinking about uh, asking Switzerland to represent it in, in, in uh, Russia. That is possible. And I would also like to mention a conference later in the summer, in July, I think it is, in Lugano, which is going to be the first conference on rebuilding the Ukraine. Something like this can always be taken up by a country that has traditionally done those services, such as Austria, such as Switzerland, uh, but also um, uh, one of the Nordic countries. 
that would be the answer to the to to that question. Yes, Ambassador, but would you precise a little bit what do you mean by representation for the non-specialists uh, in law and in uh, Sw Swiss law? What do you mean by representation? Oh, absolutely. It's it's. Uh, Sophie probably knows more about it. It's an international tool. When two countries interrupt their their relations, you ask a third country to represent you at uh, on the other side, as we do with Cuba since in in the United States since. Uh, or rather the United States in, in, in Cuba since a number of years, as we do with uh, in the case of United States and Iran. Uh, other countries have those protection, those representation mandates. It means a lot of very mundane things, consular uh, questions, etc. But it rarely, if ever, verse into real mediation in the sense of making proposition how a problem could be solved. We tried it in the very delicate relationship between the United States and Iran. And I can tell you, I can tell you more about it, but I can tell you it was not a success. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. Uh, would you like to add something, something else? I know that some of our panelists uh, have to uh, leave us. And so uh, if you're not against, I will uh, close uh, this discussion, but uh, saying that uh, it's only the beginning, of course, as uh, uh, it's not very original to say that the definition of uh, the new role of alliances, of institutions and of political postures in the future, uh, Europe is just only open. And so I, I'm absolutely sure that uh, we will have the occasion to discuss more uh, between us and uh, with uh, other actors. Thank you very much to uh, Dietmar Schweizgut and uh, the uh, team, uh, the Vienna team of uh, the uh, center. Uh, thank you very much to our panelists and to the external participants. Merci à tous et bonne journée.